Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that we can gather together and to uh, study your word. Help us, Lord, not to be uh, simply uh, coldly analytical in our discussion, but to realize that we are talking about uh, the God of the universe, the God who has revealed himself, the God who has in great mercy brought us into his family. We ask now your help in our time together. We ask for the help of the Spirit, which we most certainly need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The philosophical argument for the self-existence of God is the cosmological argument, which we have already discussed earlier uh, in the course. Now, the cosmological argument is one of the so-called theistic evidences. Uh, when we discussed these, we pointed out that the uh, arguments are not uh, demonstrable arguments, that is, they're not absolute proofs. They are evidences, they are probability statements. So, we want to look at the cosmological argument. Uh, when we talked about it, I said that it was an a posteriori argument, that is, it is an argument from effect to cause, from effect uh, to cause. Now, the argument, these arguments as a whole, and this argument, can be helpful, particularly when we are uh, talking to uh, Christians who are perhaps a little uh, befuddled and uh, need some help in, in uh, thinking through uh, God's existence. Here are the logical steps of this argument. First, something now is. Something now is. Therefore, something has always been. Reason. Nothing can be the cause of its own existence. For that presupposes that it both existed and did not exist at the same time. I think that's a very simple uh, line of argument to, to follow. Further, this something could not be produced by, by nothing that is, caused without a cause. And by the way, this is uh, something that most atheists would agree with. Uh, something has always existed. We would say has existed from, from eternity. So, the solution to this, uh, to this uh, apparent uh, problem gives us a choice between two things. First, there's an infinite series of causes. It's like the little old lady who told Stephen Hawking, or told one of the philosophers, Stephen Hawking mentions it, that the earth is a flat plate that rests on the top of a giant tortoise. And uh, he asked her at that point, well, what created the tortoise? And he, she said, well, let's not confuse the issues, it's turtles all the way down. In other words, an infinite, uh, an infinite series of turtles are the cause of, uh, cause of everything. But that is one of the choices. One of the choices is that there's an infinite series of causes that is eternal. You just eternally have a sense of or a, uh, a phase of et eternal regression or a condition of eternal regression. This presents a contradiction. Everything is caused by that which goes before it. But the whole series is caused by nothing. And of course, that's, that's illogical. That's an impossibility. That leads us to another uh, choice. There must be a first cause. There must be a first cause. And the first cause cannot be contingent. That is, it cannot be dependent on something causing it. 
Why? Uh, well, obviously, it would need a cause. So, a non-contingent being is necessary. Now, there is, of course, uh, when we talk about the cosmological argument, there is here a leap of logic, uh, of course, uh, that is, from a thing to a person. In other words, the cosmological argument can, can at least bring you to the point where there is an eternal something, but we want to go back further than that. We want to say there's an eternal someone, there is an eternal God. And to strengthen our case for a person, we have to really uh, expound the teleological arguments, which we've spoken of, that is, there seems to be purpose, there seems to be a design in the universe that would require a designer, and we would have to talk about the moral argument for God's existence, which leads us to the idea that there's a governor, a moral governor of the universe to whom we must give account. These lead us closer and closer to the idea that the first cause is a, is a person. Now, in our outline, uh, Roman numeral three, the biblical arguments for God's self-existence. The biblical arguments. And I'm going to uh, read some texts of Scripture. Psalm 94, verses 8 to 10. Psalm 94, verses 8 to 10. Pay heed, you senseless among the people. And when will you understand, stupid ones? Occasionally a teacher might wish he could say something like that, but he never would, certainly not to a class to a class like this. <coughs> and besides, this is the Lord who is speaking, and I certainly don't put myself in that category. <laughs> Pay heed, you senseless among the people, and when will you understand, stupid ones? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who chastens the nations, will he not rebuke? Even he who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are a mere breath. And essentially, the argument uh, that is being set forth here is that everything depends upon the Lord. Everything depends upon the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And uh, we really should read verses 18 to 31 to get the whole context, but we'll look at verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, Yahweh in other words, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired, his understanding is inscrutable. God here is called the everlasting God. The everlasting God. He's the genuine source of everything. He doesn't get tired. Uh, ceaseless action is the very essence of the nature of God. He's independent of his creation. Uh, the creation really depends upon him. Psalm 115. Psalm 115. Verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. He does whatever he pleases. In other words, he's independent with regard to his power. He does, he exercises his power as he sees fit. He answers to no one, he is dependent upon no one. He's not like the Chevy Volt 
that uh, is powered by a battery and after a hundred miles you have to stop at a farmhouse and ask the farmer if you can plug it in somewhere. Uh, that is not, that is not, you can tell what I think about electric powered cars. I know you may not ask a question. I'm just afraid someone will make some kind of political statement and we don't do that in this class. Daniel chapter 4 verse 35. Daniel uh, chapter 4 verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now we have some theologians that will even say things like this, but we are not we cannot really do it. We cannot really do it. God is independent in his will. He's independent in his will. So he does whatever he pleases, independent with regard to his power. He is independent with regard to his will. Then this great passage of worship and exaltation in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 and 34. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor. God doesn't need advice. God doesn't need advice. There is no heavenly presidential cabinet in heaven. God is the one who decides and does not need the counsel of others. 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Uh, he alone possesses immortality. Immortality is the ability to die. And with, in the case of fallen people, it's the necessity, really, of dying. But God alone possesses immortality. He is life's never failing fountain. He possesses deathlessness. Um, we see the word uh, immortality, when we see the word eternal, when we see the word everlasting. This means more than just endless existence. He is uh, life's never-failing fountain, as someone has said. He is the source of all, of all life. John 5, verse 26. I want to look at John 5, 26, in which... the Lord is speaking. Lord Jesus says this, <clears throat> For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. 
Goodspeed translates uh, this verse, John 5, 26, for just as the Father is self-existent, he actually uses the sort of the common theological term for this attribute of God. Now this verse, I want to comment on this or spend just a, a couple of minutes on it. And so he gave to the Son to have life in himself. Now this has been understood in two ways. What exactly does this mean when we read, uh, when Jesus says that the Father gave to the Son to have life in himself? This uh, text has been understood in two ways. And uh, I want to uh, review them for you. First, it has been understood, now I'll use the textbook term, sub specie aeternatus, aeternatatus actually, meaning from the perspective of eternity from the perspective of eternity. That's the first way it's been understood, from the perspective of eternity. Now, those who take this particular view say this, to the Son alone, begotten, not created, has the Father imported his own prerogative to have life in himself, to be self-existent. Now, these commentators say that uh, this bestowal did not begin with Jesus' ministry on earth uh, or with the incarnation. It is an eternal act. It's part and parcel of the unique Father-Son relationship. This is the a view of F.F. F. Bruce, for example, of D.A. Carson. I'm here speaking of modern commentators, but the view, the view is older than that. Uh, Bruce links it, uh, Carson does not, Bruce links it to the eternal generation of the Son. Um, View is also held by C.K. Barrett, by Leon Morris. These are all modern uh, commentators on, on uh, the Gospel of John. So it is an eternal act. Now, what, what is an eternal act? Well, what is an eternal father? What is an eternal son? Here we're, we're at a point where our uh, brains are stretched to the point where uh, if we go any further, they'll probably explode, so we just, we just leave it at that point. Not everyone holds that view. There are those who say that this verse should be understood sub specie temporis, that is, from the perspective of time, from the perspective of time. Now according to this interpretation, this refers to the Son incarnate. The thought of the Father giving something to the incarnate Son is not uncommon in uh, the Gospel of John. We see it in John 3.35, John 5.27, and so on. So this is a gift that the Father gives to the Son in the flesh. That is, he gives to the incarnate uh, Son of God. Now, writers like Calvin tell it would say that, well, we can't push this back into eternity uh, because Christ is the I am. In John, uh, John's Gospel, the Lord refers to himself a number of times as I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. Uh, these I am statements uh, really take us back to the Old Testament where Yahweh says to Moses, you tell them that I am has, that I am has sent you. 
So Calvin says we can't go back to the perspective of eternity. Rather, Jesus, God the Son, that is the incarnate Christ, the incarnate servant of the Lord, was given life so that he could communicate it uh, to others. And this is the view of uh, um, Calvin, it's the view of Bernard, it's the view of William Kelly and uh, Beasley Murray. These again are, are commentators on the Gospel, the Gospel of John. So we'll leave that discussion at that point and uh, I, I'm inclined to go with the second view but I, I, it's one of these things where I, I'm not prepared to uh, set my feet in stone. Capital letter B, the biblical names and descriptive statements. These are names that uh, lead to the notion of God's self-existence. Yes? What was that second way called? From the perspective of time. What was that? Some spe uh, sub specie temporis. Now, the biblical names and descriptive uh, titles or descriptive statements concerning God, and uh, I will say something about this. I'm going to look at some of the notes that are in the, in the printed notes with you. In the Old Testament, there are three primary names for God, and the other names that we have in uh, the Bible are all built on these three, these three names. The first is El, or Elohim. Uh, this is translated God, and probably means the strong one. It has the idea of power or strength. And just looking down at the footnote, the appellation El is the oldest Semitic name for God, appearing in Babylonian, Phoenician, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Arabic. Its great antiquity is seen in its use in early names, Methusael in Genesis 4:18 and Ishmael in Genesis 16:11. Its, etym its etymology is problematic. It has been understood to be part uh, of a verb meaning to be strong. And that's probably, uh, probably the most common idea. This is the root underlying the word meaning an oak, a mighty tree. Others connect it to an Arabic root meaning to be in front and therefore first in rank. Another view connects it to a supposed root meaning power or might, power or might. I list a group of scholars here uh, who comment on the word, and uh, these scholars and others express a wise caution and humility in trying to ex uh, explain the very complex usage uh, in the Old Testament. The word Elohim occurs 2,570 times in the Old Testament. It is sometimes used of heathen gods where it takes plural verbs. When it is used of Israel's God, now it's a plural form. That's the, that's the thing you need to note here. It's a plural, Elohim. And when it's used of the heathen gods, that is a plurality of gods, it uses obviously a plural verb. When it's used of Israel's God, however, even though the name remains plural, it takes a singular verb. Uh, the use of the singular verb is grammatically unusual. 
because nouns and verbs usually agree in number. Yet this phenomenon is stylistically normal in the Old Testament. There are a few exceptions where Elohim takes a plural verb. By itself, uh, these usages do not point to the Trinity, but with the New Testament evidence, that is, once we get to the New Testament and find three persons within the Godhead, then we say, well, now that may be, that may be uh, hinted at in the plural, the plural Elohim. The word Elohim has a wide semantic range in the Old Testament. It is used of the one true God of Israel and the false gods of the heathen. In addition, it's used of the representative of the Lord, of human judges who administer justice in accordance with the word of the Lord and of angelic beings. So that's the, uh, the word that's generally translated God in the Old Testament. The second word is Adonai, which is translated Lord or Master. And notice, it's translated Lord with uh, low case uh, in English, with low case uh, letters. The third is uh, Yahweh, called by the Jews the Tetragrammaton. There's some debate going on right now, by the way. Uh, I noticed in a recent issue of uh, Christianity Today, um, the title of the article is Barring Yahweh. And the uh, writer notes that observant Jews have traditionally not used the name Yahweh, refusing to pronounce this proper name of God out of respect. Now, Neither will Roman Catholics, at least in their worship services. And a letter from the Vatican uh, has encouraged the priests not to use the word Yahweh in their services out of respect. And so the article goes on to indicate there's a little debate now among, among evangelicals as to whether they should use the term or not use the term. It is interesting that the Jews would not pronounce this word when they came to it. If they were reading, for example, the Old Testament, they would not, they would get to the word Yahweh in the Hebrew text and they would not pronounce it. Instead, when they got to the word Yahweh, they would say Adonai. Uh, to ensure that this practice continued, when the Masoretes put vowels into the Hebrew text. The Hebrew text was originally only consonants, but when the Masoretes, uh, several hundred years after Christ, put vowels uh, into the uh, Hebrew Bible, when they got to the word Yahweh, they did not put in what you would expect they would put in, uh, vowels that would lead to the pronunciation Yahweh. Instead, they put in the vowels for Adonai, to, as to serve as kind of a hint to the reader, if he was reading the scriptures in the synagogue, that he was to say when he got to that word, not Yahweh, he would say instead, Lord, Adonai. And that's what we have in most of our English Bibles. Most of our English Bibles will have, in the Old Testament, they'll have the English word Lord capitalized, all caps. And when you see that in the Old Testament, that's the indication that the word Yahweh is uh, underneath, underneath that English word. If you, if you try to pronounce Yahweh with, the vowel, uh, Yahweh with the vowels of Adonai, you come up with something close to uh, Jehovah. The actual uh, pronunciation is debated. Most scholars suggest something like Yahweh and as I've mentioned in most modern English translations, Yahweh is translated Lord. Now, in the following discussion, we're going to consider the descriptive statements that are used with the names of God. The living God. Let me give you some references. The living God. And uh, first of all, I'm going to give you references from the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 3, 
verse 12. Hebrews 3.12, Hebrews 9.14, Hebrews 10.31, and Hebrews 12.22, where we have the title, The Living God. Now, uh, in the Old Testament, um, let me give you some references as well. In Jeremiah 10, verses 9 and 10, where God is called living, he's called everlasting, he's uncaused, eternal being. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, the Lord uh, uses this little phrase, as I live, as I live, says the Lord. Just a, a, an assumption. In Habakkuk, 112, God is the eternal God. We shall not die. Art thou not from everlasting? Uh, he is uncaused being. He's uncaused being. Now, this idea of a living God, the living God, is related to the anthropomorphisms of the Bible that we talked about uh, earlier in class. He is the living God. That is, that's in contrast to the idols of the pagan world. The idols of the pagan world are dependent. They are dead. Isaiah loves to bring this out, that, that these gods are totally dependent, and he pictures them being carried around by people uh, showing their absolute lifelessness, their absolute dependence upon uh, those who worship them. Now, while there are anthropomorphisms used of the true God, there's never any statement that God has limitations. The Bible may speak about the eye of God or the arm of God, but there's never talk about now, this is a limitation. This is not true of the pagan deities. The pagan deities have all the faults of, uh, of human beings, and all the sins of human beings as well, as a matter of fact. But God is not dependent. Let me give you an example of this that's really interesting. Yahweh has no consort. He has no helpmeet. He has no wife or goddess. The heathen gods all have consorts. The Old Testament has no word for goddess. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm sure glad there isn't. Furthermore, no images of God were allowed according to the commandments of God in Exodus chapter 20. Why not? Why not images? Well, an image represents the living God by something which is dead, lifeless. And so it, it really misrepresents, it misrepresents God. Number two in the outline. Yahweh. This is the central passage, really, on the self-existence of God. Exodus chapter 3, this is the burning bush passage. <laughs> Exodus 3.13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, 
the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. What is God's name? Well, it's Yahweh. And what is in a name? I want to remind you of something uh, that you uh, probably read uh, years ago. Uh, Romeo and Juliet. Juliet standing uh, up above, Romeo down below. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Now, if, you're just, if you've just heard that quoted, and you've never uh, seen the play or read the play, you might think that Juliet is asking, where are you, Romeo? That's not what she's asking at all. She's asking why he is called Romeo. Uh, and that's made clear in the following lines. She says, deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Uh, she's not aware that Romeo is uh, down below uh, listening to her soliloquy, and so she continues. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art, th see, the, f the fact of the matter is, the families are at odds with each other. So... Uh, it's the Capulets and the Montagues. And so she's basically mulling over this whole problem caused by a name. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thy, thyself, though not a Montague. What's a Montague? It is not hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doff thy name. And for that name which is no part of thee, take all myself. Oh, that is so romantic. <laughs> What's in a name? Uh, in our culture, uh, names have meanings, that's true, but really, uh, it'd probably be interesting if you asked your parents why they called you what they called you. I remember my wife, uh, actually, we have four children, and each of them has two names, so that's eight names. Guess how many I picked? <laughs> uh, I picked, I think, one out of the eight. Um, my wife wanted uh, Celtic, Scottish names. So all of our children have names that have some kind of Celtic, uh, Scottish, Irish uh, uh, connection. And they all have meanings. You know, they all, all these words have meanings. But oftentimes today, you, if, if they do studies of this where they'll show you that at any given time, uh, certain names are really popular. You know, at a given time, Brittany is really popular, or Candy. And Mr. Glock is wondering what the old people's homes are going to look like when the old ladies aren't calling each other Hazel and Mildred, but Candy and Brittany. He thinks that's very funny. Well, maybe, maybe it is funny. I don't know. But... Um, Oftentimes, uh, parents will be looking through books, names for children, that kind of thing, to get a name they, they like the sound of or what, whatever. Uh, the meaning is not paramount in our culture. It's, it's what happens to be a popular name at the point. And that shows us a little bit about the great cultural difference, really, between us and the Old Testament world. Because in the Old Testament world, names meant everything. Names were often sentences, actually. Sentence names. 
Names were common nouns and verbs from the living language, and they were taken and given to a, given to a person. So names are very significant uh, in the Bible. A name is a definition. It tells you something about the person. It tells you about his nature, his behavior, his disposition. Imagine Nabal. Look at the margin. Fool. <laughs> um, what kind of name is that? God's, God's answer, of course, is rightly capitalized in most versions when Moses says, who will I say sent me? I am, and it's capitalized. I am who I am. In the strongest terms, God asserts his absolute being, his absolute being. He exists. That's what that tells you. I am, not I came into being out of that burning bush, but I am. He's dependent upon nothing and no one excepting his own will. I am, not a static thing, an active existence, pulsing with power, throbbing with life. And then he goes on and says in verse 15, the Lord is his name. And underneath that word is the Hebrew Yahweh, Yahweh. Uh, when you say I am and you say Yahweh, uh, they don't seem to have much connection to each other uh, in English at least, but both are from the same Hebrew verb, Hayah, which is to be, I am. In verse 14, it's in the first person. Yahweh, in verse 15, is in the third person. He is. It's interesting, by the way, that uh, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, says, ego eimi, ego eimi, I am, or the full phrase is, ego eimi, Ha'on, I am the one who is. I am the one who is. So it's very, uh, it really focuses on God's self-existence. The very name of God tells us this. You can write down uh, a few references from Isaiah. Isaiah 41.4. Isaiah 43.10. Isaiah 44.6. Isaiah 48, 12. Some say that, uh, the na that, name e that everything that we know about God is basically uh, based on comparing him with, with uh, things we know on earth. Well, that's not true. Here's a, here's a name, I am. That's an absolute, just an absolute standalone term. Now, Yahweh is given a relational sense here. Yahweh is the covenant name. Notice what he says. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, now notice, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Now, what does that link Yahweh to? when he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Well, it links him to the covenant. You see, this is his covenantal name. I've made a covenant with your fathers. I have a relationship with your fathers. So it's a, it's a, relational, it's a relational term. It speaks of his pledge. He has pledged his being. He has pledged his name and the name of God like sometimes in the Bible we'll read, blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, that just means blessed be the Lord. The name stands for, for him. Stands for him. 
We'll stop there. I want to say just another word or two about, about this name next time when we pick it up uh, at that point.